it's the next level. Attention all passengers. The temperature outside is minus 121.9 degrees Celsius. As we approach Chicago, mile zero of our cycle of life, be prepared to brace. We're all haunted by our choices. The personal choices we all made when we boarded this train. And the collective choices that brought us to that day. Choices made over decades, even when we knew climate change was real. And finally, my own choice to pirate this ark and lie to you all, which has brought us to where we are now. May we all move forward with greater awareness of the choices that we make. We are one train. And today, that train chooses change. I hereby relinquish governance of Snowpiercer to the rebel forces. These are our revolutions. 994 cars long. Hey, panelers. Welcome back to the show. I'm Mark. And I'm Steve. And we're going to be covering Snowpiercer Episode 9, Old Ways, Old Wars, and Episode 10, which is entitled... 994 Cars. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit of a spoiler title there, I think, but if you just looked at the title. Um, but, uh, <laughs> you know, the, the fact they put these two, or 994 cars long, I'm sorry, you know, it, but they put these two episodes together, so it's really, it didn't really matter that much that they kind of maybe spoiled it for some people if you, if you kind of looked ahead at the episode titles. You know, I guess technically, you know, we are a spoilerful podcast, so if you haven't watched... The finale of Snowpiercer Series 1, what are you doing listening to us? Because I guess technically now it's what, 900, it's what, 1,000? It was 1,001 cars. It was 1,001, then they lost the 7, so it's 994, and then Big Alice attached to the end of it, and that's, what did they say, 40 cars long? Yeah. So that's, so now it's 1,000, whatever, 34 cars, I guess. <laughs> I You know, if Big Alice is, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. We're getting ahead of ourselves, getting into to episode exactly. 10. But this was a great, I love, this was a really great season finale. I'm really glad they tied these two episodes together, because it was it was really cool to watch. It would have, I mean, it would have been something for us to have to wait a week in between them, but I think it still would have been pretty good, you know, because we could have seen the end of the revolution and then we would have to wait a week to see the aftermath of the revolution. But instead, you know, it goes right into it. Oh, definitely. And I loved watching it because it was like watching like a two hour movie. Absolutely. At that point, you know, I think they're like about 40 some odd minutes each, mm -hmm. but it works out in a sense where you're just continuing into the story. And there was so much that was going on from episode nine to episode 10. And then, and it just leaves off at a huge cliffhanger in my opinion but yeah, i think that we're in for some fun once it comes back next season too. oh yeah oh yeah for sure for sure i'm i'm uh, i'm excited for when it's going to come back i hope it comes back sooner rather than later but we'll see oh definitely so we're going to start off with uh episode nine old ways old wars and the synopsis of that episode is the rebel forces are on their heels when a dangerous foe joins them a plan is hatched to take the train but it may destroy them all and yes there yeah, there was so much going on within mm -hmm. what the rebels were trying to do there's so much going on within like the cars itself between melanie 
everything everybody that's trying to take control on them on their own too of the higher ups like from mm -hmm. the first class and everything else so and then are also dealing with the tailies and they're also dealing with what's in third as well as the brakeman so i i think you know they they shoved a lot and they do fast and it's kind of like what cat was saying is like it's very much like what they were doing in other shows at one point where they were just pushing, pushing, and they were going at full speed ahead, and yeah, they, they took people. <laughs> yeah, it definitely was a lot. There was a lot packed into uh, this first episode and then, then the second episode as, as well, and there's some things that we missed out on, and maybe they'll pick up those things the next next season, but we'll see. But yeah, yeah, for sure, this, this episode nine was just really, really good to see the kind of end of the rebellion, the revolution, I guess. Well, it's the end of the rebellion, but it, <laughs> I, 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 now I sound like Star Wars. But the thing yeah. is, is that it's the end of the rebellion. But uh, regardless, I, it's, it's something that's new and it's mm -hmm. almost like a new society that they have to develop now because they broke down a whole society. And they have to come together within it. And I really enjoy that idea for the fact that it's kind of like mimicking of what's going on in the real world right now in some respects. But the fact that they actually are doing a lot of new things to get people incorporated, more of a democracy. But the people that were in power are really suffering at this point. And we see that throughout the episode, too. Or actually, the next two episodes. Yeah, so I'm saying the next really we see more because really episode nine is really more about just getting taking control of the yeah. train. And so yeah, so if we if we want to, I mean, we could lump them together, but we should probably start with our top five for episode nine by itself. Yes, we should, and we'll do that now. Good evening, passengers. Be advised, track conditions will deteriorate over the next twenty four hours. And I think you should go first. Okay, I'll go first. Uh, I just thought it was really interesting, the whole execution method that they were doing, the whole lung full of ice thing. And, you know, we've, we've kind of discussed before about why these things are on the train, whether they put them on the train after the stowaways came on or if these were something that they had in, that they already had in mind, you know, before the train started. And it, I don't know if we'll ever get the answer to that. But I thought it was it was kind of interesting this just that they had this kind of method to for execution where they pumped basically a lung full of the outside air into somebody and the guard he tells Melanie to take one big gulp and that'll make it go faster or make it go easier, or something like that. That's very similar to there's things that executioners would say to whether whatever the method yeah, was, electric chair was. or yeah electric or chair or, or injection uh, lethal injection or even you know when they hang somebody they would kind of give them a little bit of a you know this is what you need to do to make sure that the next snaps you know don't don't tense up or something like that and in the same thing kind of with lethal injection they're like you know don't tense up don't don't get excited or something yeah like, that. like if you remember it, the green so, mile too remember with the sponge and everything mm -hmm. with the sponge yeah right exactly there's little things that they would do to make sure that the execution went yeah. well yeah and the fact that it it goes back to what daphne was saying when she and i were podcasting on this that they use the elements the outside elements of what's going on outside mm -hmm. as a way yeah. of a tool to not just torture people, but to use it as their for uh, sort of like justifying their punishments or executions or, or things mm -hmm. of that nature, or even interrogation. Right, or even like you said, the sacrifices to the train that you're you're using the elements and using the implements of the train for it's almost like a sacrifice, like a sacrificial element to it. That, yeah, uh, like so. a higher power or something, but they don't really mm -hmm. regard it as such, but they just utilize it for their own needs to make their yes. society you know continue on mm -hmm. my number five would be though melanie was locked in with the others she seemed to have a lot of empathy and understanding of the people while she awaited her own fate you know that that fate that she had of being executed that opening scene was eye-opening she wanted a lot for the people within the train and the symbol of wilford there too that that was just I'm like, mm -hmm. I started thinking way back to like aliens, almost like Waylon Yutani from the Alien series, 
but with this, it seems more real with the character that has to help all those on the train with how Melanie is thinking, you know? Mm-hmm. I, I think that's why she was so free when she was able to have a jumpsuit like all the rest that worked on the train. Mm-hmm. You know, she wasn't bound to this whole status at that point. She just wanted to be herself as a creator, somebody who created the the train as well as it was, and to, you know, be involved with the train. She wanted to be like them. She wanted to be part of those people, you know, just someone that does a job. Yeah, well, she was definitely trying to develop that rapport with them where she, like, she asked the guy his name, she gives him the handkerchief for his head, and, and one of the other guys is like, sure, his name matters now that you're locked in here with him. But even then, you could see from that remark that she was really trying to reach out. And we're, we're seeing, you know, the softer side, like you said, of, of Melanie. We're seeing the, the side... The human. The, the side that actually cares about the people uh, on the train. So, yeah. Yeah. So my number four is just that that whole scene between Bennett and Miles where he's looking at the security camera footage and he sees Miles let LJ into the engine room and then he kind of well tells him, you know, he calls him a calls him some names and then he puts him in his chair and he tells him to be quiet and shut up and I can't believe you did that. But then there's this very quick kind of turnaround just in those few seconds when Miles sees the radio and he's like, oh, is that a radio? Is that, what are you doing with that? And at first he's like, shut up. And then he's like, well, no, here's what I'm doing. I got to communicate with the people down the train. I can't use the regular communications because, you know, they might be listening. And then Mm -hmm. towards the end, when they're doing the uncoup, the whole uncoupling thing, he actually has Miles helping him with the uncoupling operation and with getting the train back on track once they, the cars reconnect. It was cool, but at the same time, it was it was kind of a quick turnaround for Bennett there to you know one minute he's kind of mad at at Miles and the next minute he's like basically well I need you I need your help with this well you know well Miles is the future of the train at this point mm-hmm. if you think about it you know he, he was indoctrinated into that where they were prepping these kids well but I mean he they were trying I think they were trying to indoctrinate him, but I don't think they succeeded they didn't succeed because that's why he let LJ in. That's why he went with at, with Andre's plan. That was the, yeah. the whole thing was that they didn't succeed. And I think maybe that's part of what Bennett got mad. But we also see he does that, need the kid. That Bennett, <laughs> again, well, again, and, and Bennett and Melanie both, they really want what's best for yes. the train. They're not, they're not really, they don't care first class, second class, third class tail. They don't care. They want what's best for Yeah, he had put train. resentment, resentment aside from the kid going with Andre and mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. Well, my number four would be Pike's change within the episode. He, he was changed with power. He wants power of his own mm-hmm. and he seems very manipulative for all the wants that he has always desired because he always saw the first class, the seconds getting what they wanted he he was turned by the the front of the train basically because they just threw this like this is your kingdom kind of attitude it's like you could have what we have he tasted what they had and wanted to change Leighton's thoughts and you know have Leighton surrender at a certain point it was his Mm -hmm. way of manipulating uh Leighton at certain points kind of like uh, what Stephen Ogg generally does with his evil characters if we go back to walking dead or even westworld at, at a certain point too even though he was a robot i mean yeah pike pike was my number three so i'll just move right into what i was going to talk because he's kind of playing both sides there because you're right i mean he's manipulating things but at the same time he's kind of an opportunist he's an opportunist he's gonna he's gonna grab at yeah. you know the first thing he wants to do is he says i'll get Leighton. basically he tells them i'm assuming what the plan was is that he tells them that he'll convince Leighton to surrender because Leighton doesn't have the bloodlust to fight. He doesn't. That Leighton will see his surrender as the the best way to for things to get back to normal. But he doesn't know what what Leighton's mm-hmm. got planned. He doesn't realize that Leighton has been talking with Melanie until after. You know, so he's he's trying to and then Correct. like that whole scene where he takes over the Folgers' cabin and he's in there and he's got you know he's basically running like a bordello up in the, 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 the master bedroom. He's got, I'll bet you didn't know you'd ever make love. You have sex in a whatever, you know, and, and LJ's just, 
she's so mad at him, but then he throws her out of the cabin and basically takes over that first class cabin that I thought was, was really interesting is, is it's one of those things that you're like, like he's kind of, like I said, he's kind of playing both sides, but at, then at the end, when he realizes that basically Andre and Melanie are probably going to succeed in getting rid of the other faction. So then he sides up with them. Yeah. You know, so he's, he's going to side up with whoever's in power kind of thing. Yeah, whatever benefits him at that point. He's like you exactly. said, he's an opportunist, so he's going to do whatever he needs exactly. to get what he wants. <laughs> so you're number three. My number three would be Jinju's help with Melanie's escape mm -hmm. from death. Yeah, there's a trust there. That engineer, you know, I think it was Bennett, came to her aid at the oh, time no, of her execution. Oh, no, it was Hobby. We'll, we'll get to that in a second. Cause he's, he, cause, it was Hobby. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I always get them confused. But go ahead. Finish yours. Yeah, and then something for, like, a cause that Melanie mm -hmm. holds dear, obviously. You know, she wants everything right for the train. Or is it some sort of fear of what is to come? You know, they're not sure entirely where their efforts are going to go. Interesting. Yeah, because this kind of plays right into my my number two uh, for this episode, which is the Javi character, because he's the one that helps Melanie out there in the execution car. But it, it was a little confusing even the second time. Actually, the first time I watched it, it didn't confuse me because I wasn't sure who it was. I was kind of like with you. I was back and forth. Is that Bennett or is that Javi? And But then at, exactly. when I watched <laughs> it the second time, I had the closed captioning on. She calls him Javi, so I know it's Javi. And, okay. But how did he get – here's the thing. We see him and Nolan, and they Nolan says something about we've got to get control of the engine. And so Javi says, well, I'm going to have to go over here and do something with the computers. And he says – but how did he get away from Nolan and be able to get dressed up like a guard and then help and put this whole plan in motion to rescue Melanie? That that, that whole thing just seemed to, to go way too quickly. And they either that or we, we something was left out in the middle there that showed Jinju and Javi getting that set up because it just didn't see it's it just we didn't see how he got away from Nolan so that he'd be able to go dress up like a guard switch places with a guard excuse me and then come to Melanie's aid it didn't seem you know right in the middle of all these executions going on because the, even the woman who was doing the execution she seemed to know what was going on because remember she comes out and she delays because she goes oh I can't identify this person so we're not gonna be able to execute her until I know for sure who she is you know, so she knew, so oh, I, I think yeah. she knew what was going on. And so it just seems we, there's something missing there in between Nolan and, and Javi walking away, saying they're going to get control of the engine. And then suddenly Javi is in the execution car dressed up like a guard, hmm. you know? Well, you know, we got to suspend our uh, Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I, I get it to him. It was know? a good, it was a really good way to, to rescue Melanie. I just think, it, I just wish there would have been something there to help us reconnect those two those two things because even you know jinju admits that oh there's people that that do agree with you and i didn't realize it until the second second or third watch i can't remember the gun that the the one guy gets from the teacher in the first class dining car she gives yes. him wait or he gives her he gives her the gun that's the gun yes. that roche pulls out of the bag when he puts the gun to Nolan to get him to uncuff Leighton. Correct. Yeah. So somehow the whole, there was this whole plan. There's whole parts of this plan that we didn't really see. And that we, as a viewer are just expected to go, Oh, okay. I see how this all kind of falls into place. Yeah. So keeping in mind listeners, if there's a Blu-ray re release of this uh, season, they might be added features there, based there might upon be some deleted, deleted scenes. scenes yeah. You know? We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> so what was your number two? My number two would be Melody getting through, uh, Melanie's getting through to Leighton and mm -hmm. using the, the track to divert a car of power. Mm -hmm. She was really truthful of what she wanted to do from day one. Uh, I think the rich in the front were too much of an influence of things that were going on within the train. And that was her way of like, let's just, <laughs> it's like getting really, basically getting rid of, you know, bad laundry it's like here get rid of it just like let's well, get get it out of here and then we can move on yeah you know? she recognized that those military militaristic jackboots weren't going to be able to hold authority she knew that the Folgers and and nolan were not gonna be able to, to be in control there was always going to be this faction that was against them so she had to get rid of them and so i you know that's one of those things that i don't think i i didn't even expect it i got got this in my notes 
or I may have it as my number one, actually. Now, yeah, it's kind of in my number my number one here is is just this whole thing that what she does with Leighton, where it's not really a manipulation, but she makes Leighton basically become the monster. Take charge. Well, but take Not just take charge, but she makes him become the monster that she is. Because, yes. because he suddenly has to sacrifice those however many people were in that car of yes. his friends. Yeah, he had to take the he had to use the power that mm-hmm. was granted to him to make a sacrifice. Right. Oh wait, here we are again talking about sacrificial lambs. Right, exactly. Know? And he goes in there and he tries to unlock them, but he can't unlock them. And then he waits till the very last second to to uncouple that car and we see them drift away and then they they get shunted off to that other track and like the the mom and dad Folger realize what's happening that they've been been separated from the train and yeah. just this whole idea that uh, that they can that they can separate cars from the train when i thought about it the first time i saw it i was like well that doesn't make any sense why would they be able to do that but it actually does when you think about it it makes sense that they would have some sort of they would have to have Maybe not have to have, but I think they would have to have some sort of plan in place to where if a car gets damaged or if there's like a fire or or something like that and you have to remove a car mid trip, you know, mid while the train is moving, they already had this way to do that. They had these junctions set up and they had these branches off the track where they could go ahead and separate a car from the, the main train and then recouple. Yeah, I thought it was really cool and uh, the the watching that yeah obviously that comes into play later right. on well, it, it, just the preciseness of this this whole plan that everything and i've got it i've got the quote from roche in my in our quotes when we get to the quote section about it but just the preciseness of the plan everything had to go perfect or it would be disaster oh definitely and, and there's there was a precision to it that had to be executed at the right time and you were tense oh. as you were watching oh, it yeah. too both times every time i watched it i was tense because i was like even though i knew it was going to happen it was still just and they played it so well and you just see the pain on Leighton's face when he has to sacrifice those people yeah you could see it as he's walking away and then he had to close the door and then the look on his face mm-hmm. and the the look on the face of the people that he left behind in that car that were like slowly freezing at that point mm-hmm. once it was like it that that car mm-hmm. gave way yep and it was rolling back behind them it, it was so upsetting but the fact that well you know they they had to get rid of two things obviously if you think about it because they got rid of not just what was it the the first it wasn't the first class it was basically it wasn't all of first class and i've got this in my it, it's there's i've got more of this for the next episode because we actually learn the numbers and how many cars and exactly all that in the actually next episode but so you didn't lose the entire first class but we'll we'll get to that when we get to episode 10 all right so i think your number one sure my number one would be seeing Leighton sacrifice obviously mm-hmm. you, you already yeah. spoke about it so you know he couldn't free everyone in the car where they were held for termination and that was really hard but with miles helping the engineer you know that would have been bennett i think right mm-hmm. yes yeah. yeah that's that's miles and bennett together yeah, yeah i got that, that right mm-hmm. yeah yeah yeah, yeah <laughs> they were right. able to lock in Leighton's car and then Melody stated that she knew he had to cut them off, you know, to right. save others. And, you know, that I, you know, to me, that was that ultimate what the, but it was great. But, mm-hmm. you know, thank goodness we didn't have to wait for, you know, this, this cliffhanger for a season, you know, because right. they could have easily just left it off at that and gone on to season two. Because if you think about it, if they oh, left. Oh, I see what you're saying. But. Oh no, I don't I think I mean I understand what you're saying, but at the same time, uh we needed episode 10 to set up for season for season 2. It there, did. There, yeah. Season 9 by itself would not have left us enough. I mean, it would have given us some things for season 2, but episode 10 sets up so much more for well, season 2. Well, with with episode 10, we get a little bit of closure of what had happened before with this now and then they mm-hmm. left us with the cliffhanger for what's going to happen for season right. two right yeah 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 so we've got a few quotes here i went ahead and took one of mine out because i don't but i because i like this quote better and this is the one that i was kind of talking about a little bit was when when melanie 
gives up the the power to Leighton and there or actually it's it's in that original talk when she's when she's telling him that she wants to help she's telling him they can uncouple these cars they can get rid of the jackboots and he kind of says he doesn't trust her and her response is just so beautifully said by Jennifer Connelly she says what do you want me to say I'm mean I'm ruthless I'm a monster yeah sure all of that and now what my way didn't work maybe yours will Yep, and I just thought that 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 her it's her surrender to him, you know, and then uh, her at the end saying that the train is yours. So yeah, the one I have would be the opening dialogue from Melanie. That mm-hmm. was really intense just to hear from the very beginning. You know, the way she states it, uh, she states, "I thought I could create a kinder and gentler world, but the train demanded otherwise. The train demanded blood. I fret her, but now they will." Until we reach our final destination, the same pain and guilt, holding our losses close on Snowpiercer, 1,001 cars long. I get, yeah, it was that that really... gave me goosebumps just reading that too. Yeah. Oh, it gave me goosebumps listening to you say it. Like, <laughs> like, like it was just because it's, it's so cool. Those, all those opening monologues have been, have been great this season. I hope they, they carry that through. They have season to. Two. Yeah. They, it makes so much sense because they've gotten, to a format now where they you know they have individual characters and their point of view Mm -hmm. and where they're going within the actual story and where their character development is going yeah yeah so my last one was the one that i kind of talked a little bit about earlier it's when 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 they're telling roche the plan and uh, what they're gonna do and melanie finally admits to him i didn't write down what she said because it, it because what he says is way better but he's like well what happens if if something does go wrong and she says the back half of the train will freeze and the front half will starve and i loved his response was hmm okay thought so I just wanted to hear someone say it out loud so we all know how freaking stupid this is. Exactly. <laughs> I yeah. thought it was great. I thought it was great. <laughs> the, the, how frick- I just want to hear somebody say it out loud so we know how freaking stupid this is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the last one I would have would be when Bess approaches Roche while he's having his lunch. And Bess states, fight for your family. Fight for your freaking lunch meat. <laughs> and then and then Roach goes, it's a travesty to call it lunch meat. <laughs> I have sa- – I, I eat sandwich for lunch often. But, uh, yeah. No, I, that was a great – that was a great one. Um, so we've got a few notes here of things we didn't, uh, didn't discuss. Um, why don't you go with your first one because it's kind of very similar to my first one as well. Yeah, that would be Ruth's use of getting information about Melanie while checking out her quarters, mm-hmm. uh, finding all the speeches on thumb drives. She's determined to stop Melanie and take on her role on the train. You know, she's getting to that point of greed where she wants what Melanie had at this point, you know, because we all know uh, in the beginning of this episode, obviously, Melanie was taken away for execution. So yeah. now she thinks, oh, I could adopt that role. Yeah, exactly. And I love how she wants to maintain the order and the guidelines that Mr. Wolford, and I put those those that in quotes, uh, had set up because we really know that it's not really the guidelines and, and order that she's been talking about are all the things that Melanie has been doing, not Mr. Wilford. And so it, it's kind of interesting that, you know, then she sees all those manuals and stuff that indicate that, that Mr. Wilford maybe did have kind of a hand in designing the train, but definitely Melanie still had a lot of information, a lot of knowledge about that train and how it worked. So I, I think at the best of it, she and Wilford had to be working together. Oh, yeah. Maybe she didn't do it completely by herself, but I don't think he did it completely by himself either. I think of Melanie kind of like the designer of the Titanic, if you remember the mm-hmm. movie where... I never saw it. Oh, what? <laughs> never saw it. Okay. I don't ever want to see it either. So, go, but, go, but go ahead. Go ahead. Basically, you know, uh, even in true, true life, the designer of the Titanic was actually on the Titanic and he sank with it, but he knew it better than anybody. And whereas the, you know, the captain of that ship and everything else, and I would think of Wilfred as being the captain, knowing how to drive and do everything. But, you know, the designer knew more about the ship and as whereas Melanie knows everything there is about Snowpiercer. Right. So uh, I I think in what's going to happen in the next season, if we do see Wolford, which pretty much is almost a given that you're going to... I'm not giving anything away. I saw part of the preview. I'm not giving anything but, away. But, you know, I think uh, they'll come to a head where you'll see where Melanie comes into 
more knowledge of Snowpiercer because she designed it, you know? Uh, so you had a couple more notes here. We may have discussed most of Yeah, this you already discussed the one that was about Roche talking about the pack half. Mm -hmm. But I'll go on to the last one, which would be Miles and, and, and Bennett working together. You know, he's learning really fast and is helping out with everything in some respect. You know, he's attained that respect by, you know, mm -hmm. Bennett to be helpful because, you know, he was being groomed to yeah. be an engineer himself. This kid is going to be crucial to the train later on, I feel. Yeah, and my only last little note for this episode was I, I didn't notice it in the previous episode, and I actually remarked while Kat and I were talking that it looked like Strongboy didn't have the black teeth from the Cronall, but in this episode, you can clearly see that he does have the black teeth and stuff from the Cronall use when he was in the in the drawer. So Oh, wow. Yeah, so I noticed it in this when I did the, my rewatches of, this, of these episodes here, so. Episode 10, the actual season finale episode, 994 cars long. And the synopsis is, in the revolution's aftermath, Leighton and Melanie realize the greatest threat to their survival is right over their shoulder. Wow. <laughs> so I went first on the, in episode 9, so why don't you go first here for episode 10. Good evening, passengers. Be advised, track conditions will deteriorate over the next 24 hours. Sure. My number five would be the change in the government, quote unquote, I should say, now mm -hmm. on that train, you know, how the people want to change the class classes and what is involved with that. Leighton being in charge of what is going on from for the most part, from what we could tell, even mm -hmm. though Melanie's in the back of his head at certain points. Right. And he's making all the decisions, the loss of cars of the people that had to be sacrificed but mm -hmm. with great change comes great decisions and melanie made that change at the end of the last episode by putting leighton in that position yeah and putting that in his head right and in the beginning of this one where we see her she comes on and she starts the announcements and then she passes it on to Leighton, who, who gets on the mic and does, Correct. does yeah. the announcements. So my number five is just what we kind of already talked a little bit about, but I, I've got the specifics here because it's in my notes. So they uncoupled seven cars, which that leaves us with the 994 cars. Mm -hmm. uh, Melanie at one point says there was 147 people were lost in those cars. And we know it was, we know for sure that it was Commander Nolan, the Folgers, and most of, if not all of his jackboot army. And then when Leighton is addressing the people in that first class dining car, and he's talking about what you said about the new government, about a constitution being written, having mm -hmm. a representative government. But he tells, he says, and I think I got all these right. He said, we have the guild leaders, the department heads and passenger representatives were in that train. And he wanted them all to have that positive attitude to show the rest of the passengers that this is going to be a smooth transition into a new type of government. So I thought that was really a cool, cool way to start the episode to let us know exactly how many people were lost. They didn't lose all of first class because I think what did we what did they say? First class had to be about three hundred people, th two or three hundred people, something like that. So if you, yeah. if you if you take away the jack boots from that one hundred and forty seven, it's probably a big chunk of first class, but it's it's definitely not all of first class was lost. Hmm. That would lead me to my number four, yeah, which would be Miss Audrey's power. That is interesting to me. You know, you know, are we going to see that come up later? Uh, she has some sort of insight on people, how and who they are. You know, is this just a perception or truly a power? Yeah, you know, regarding people and their in, their in, you know their yeah. This was my number four with. as well as just Melanie's uh, her her night car session because at the beginning of it, Miss Audrey says this is that you've never done this before, and there's almost a hypnosis to it because it's uh, you know I used to watch the show because it's done now. Uh, Criminal Minds they used to do what they called cognitive memory, where they would where they would walk somebody mm -hmm. through their memories, and they would be like, "What do you smell?" What do you see? What do you hear? Those kind of things. And it's almost Miss Audrey did kind of the same thing, that it's almost a hypnotic element drawing people in to these memories. And so she really is more than just a counselor, more than a psychologist. You know, there's there's a whole bunch more involved in this night car. And I, I hope that we do get a chance to explore it uh, a little deeper, and especially Miss Audrey. Because not, you know, like we saw with Zara, not all of the night car 
workers have that power, I don't think, but there's definitely something there. And I thought it was really cool. This, this, on my rewatches, the foreshadowing of seeing Melanie, Melanie having the memory of her daughter and then her daughter showing up at the end of the episode, I thought was really cool. Yeah, definitely. My number three would be Pike <laughs> just acts like a clown within the scene yeah. when he takes over the first class car area. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, the the character has changed from when we first saw him. You know, Stephen Ogg, I mentioned it before, is a great actor, and we've seen him in The Walking Dead as Simon and in Westworld yeah. as pretty much like a uh, a robot. And I'm curious if this is something to do with the drawers, or is this his true character now and him, quote unquote, claiming what he thinks is right by him and the people in the tale. You know, he's... Yeah, and I, I guess I had it confused. I guess I had it confused because this scene was, I thought this scene was in nine, but it ha- is actually in in 10, you're right. When he throws her out of the, when he throws LJ out of the cabin, because it's after the cars are uncoupled that he takes over that cabin. That's when I started thinking about yeah. that there's still part of the first class train cars are still there. Mm-hmm. So I, I'd like to, I'd love to know if they tell us what those seven cars were that we lost. We know that definitely they lost that school car because mm-hmm. that's what the the Folgers and Nolan were in was in that that car that had been designed as like a school room. Yes. So we, we know we lost that one, but I, I'd be interested to know what those other six cars, or those, you know, those seven cars were that, that they actually lost because like I said before, they still had the first class dining car. They still have some of the first class cabins. So, you know, what cars did they actually lose maybe food that. yeah that's the thing i don't know because they said um that they still had the agricultural because remember people were raiding for the lettuce and stuff and that's when they find out that pike was kind of leaving the black market and those people were trying to take that shopping cart full of lettuce when roche and the brakeman caught them mm-hmm. you know so it's it's an interesting thing to see um uh, where they're going to go with that and how that's how that's going to play out you know, what are they going to do with the tailies that are still back there in the tail? Are they just going to leave them there? Are they going to try to redistribute them throughout the third class and second class cabins or what's left over? Are they going to like Leighton commented? I think it was episode seven or eight. Uh, it might have been eight where he comments that they had a bowling alley. And so you have a if, if that's not one of the cars that was lost, then they have this they have a huge room that they can that they can peep that they can house people in if they need to. So mm, true give them better accommodations maybe than what's back in the tail. Cause remember miles has that conversation with Bennett about, well, you could have given more power. You could have given more heat to the tail, but you chose not to mm. because there's always haves and have nots when he's having that talk with Bennett the last episode. Yeah, that is true. Uh, so we're at, we're at my number two or your number three. I have number two next. Okay. It's your number two. Then yeah. yeah Cause you're already, two. I think you tailed on to mine about Stephen Ogg and a little bit. Yeah, yeah I did. I, I tell that was my number three was the same was we had very similar number three. So yeah, your number two. So yeah, my number two would be Daphne had a, a hinted about this at uh, the fact of another train one we recorded previously. That was a shock to me, honestly, but it does make a lot of sense. Wolford definitely would have a contingency plan in effect for you know, supplies before he set the train mm-hmm. in motion for the main train. I wonder if there is another train as well, you know, maybe more than they are, you know, are aware of, because at this point, at the end of this episode, they see another train coming. Maybe there is another one that's on the tracks. Well, no, no, they're just, they're, no, I don't think so. There's just the two trains. They just, the, the train that, that latched onto theirs was the huh. only other train. I mean, there could be, I'm not saying there's not a third train out there, but there, there's only the two trains okay. in this episode. There wasn't, because what he, what he did, what Bennett did at the beginning of the episode was he saw yeah. the second train and he, that's when he cut mm-hmm. the satellite feed. And that's why Melanie got so mad at him and went out alone was because she's like, we, we could have made this decision together. We could have figured out if we knew, because, you know, he, he couldn't hide the music because Javi had yes. heard the music, but he was able to hide that it was coming from a second train until they actually had the visual. And that's how, how that train caught up with them was because they had slowed down to figure out what that sound was. And it all, that's what it all tied in, why Melanie got so mad at Bennett, because it all mm. tied into him you know, basically manipulating things so that the other train could catch up to him. Like you said, and his, you know, his initial reason was sound that he said, 
we need the supplies that are on that train. But then Melanie assumes that Mr. Wilford is on that is on that train. And this is my number two. That's why I'm kind of going straight into this. Is this the whole discovery yeah. of this other train? Uh, and that it was a supply train. They call it Big Alice. I wonder if it's been running the entire seven years. How did it have a separate track? Was it what was it doing all this time? Has it been traveling just behind them all this time, waiting until the moment would it be able to catch up with them? Has it just been traveling? Because it's a smaller train, so maybe it's just been traveling in the Chicago area. Like you said, maybe there's other supply trains that are just traveling like in the Chicago area, and they had ways that they could remotely activate those trains so that they could latch on. And now that makes sense of why it had that contraption on the front of it, which that was a cool scene. The CGI work was yeah. really cool about that. Uh, I, I didn't really, the, the CGI work of the trains switching tracks wasn't as good as when they uncoupled the trains. Cause it, when they uncoupled the trains, man, it was, you could see the tracks move and you could see it was really cool. But with this one, when it caught up to them, but that whole thing where the front of that train opens and it latches on to the back of, uh, of snow piercer, you're like, Oh, that was just a really cool scene. And now again, it's one of those things that I realized they, they needed to have that because if they were going to resup, if they had resupply trains, they'd have to have a way for that train to, couple to you know oh, latch yeah. on to them you know and so so that's why that whole contraption was even there that front of the train opening up and basically looking like it's eating the back of the train i thought it was <laughs> really cool you know and then you have these two groups that are waiting for this door to open you have one group that's got weapons and they're gonna fight and then you have ruth and her group with the children singing you know that they're singing the praises of mr <laughs> wilford and uh, i just thought it was it was really cool and i loved how layton found a way to kind of bridge the gap between them where he goes you're right let's try diplomacy first so you stay with me he said that like three times he said ruth you're with me you stay with me you know, because he wanted to make her make her understand for sure that you're not the one who's in charge here, Ruth. I'm still in charge, but I'm going to let you lead this delegation. But we're going to have a oh, show yeah. of force to back us up. And uh, that's where they had Stephen Ogg when they convinced him to join with them. Uh, and we'll see what happens. He may flip sides again. Mm. Who knows? <laughs> so you're number one. Well, I saw that foreshadowing of Melanie's daughter coming into play once they showed the flashback scenes when she was mm -hmm. with uh, Miss Audrey, you know. I didn't think it would be this soon, though, that, that we would actually see her daughter come on the train. Mm -hmm. And in my thoughts, that, that was the last thing. But, you know, I thought she would be on the train. Uh, that's interesting that you because I, I didn't I didn't catch it until the moment when, when we see that it's a girl. As soon as I saw that it was a girl, uh, wa you know, even though it was short hair, you could tell that it was a female. And I was like, oh, it's got to be Melanie's daughter. It's just got to be. And my number one is, uh, I've already kind of talked about it a little bit, was just the whole argument between Melanie and, and Bennett there before she goes outside by herself. And, you know, it's fortuitous that, that the train, it's the brakes, it's the breaking of the train that forces her off. So she's not too far away from where they are or where the trains, you know, met up with each other. So it's going to be interesting to see how they get her back on the train before the elements, you know, I don't know how long she can survive out there with that suit, but I thought it, another question that came to me the, the last time watching it was why didn't she go outside closer to where the other train was? Cause it seemed like she was like two or three cars. She had to go and she's like untethering herself and jumping from car to car, really, you know, risking falling off the train while it's moving. Oh yeah. So I didn't understand why she could, wasn't able to get out closer to, but I think it might've been because she wasn't, she wouldn't be able to go through the tailies cause that's where the tailies were at. So she, so yeah. yeah so would, she, yeah. Yeah. So she had heartbeat. to be somewhere before the tailies <laughs> started, but then close enough to where she could at least get to that part of the train. Very true. I had two quotes here as he, um, that I had, I thought it was really interesting that when they're having the whole discussion, when Leighton gives his idea of representative government, Ruth says, utopian twaddle will never hold this train together. Uh, I thought that was kind of cool. And then I got goosebumps when I heard Till, uh, when she was having that that breakup with Jinju, and Jinju says, do you want to be alone? And, and Till, it's great, it's such a great line from Till, where she says, I'm not alone, I've got my sisters and brothers that I stood with, and a responsibility to Snowpiercer that I never felt before. And I guess I got goosebumps saying hmm. it, but it was cause it's just so cool to hear her, you know, the previous episode or episode eight, when she said, I chose a side 
And when Leighton says she's one of us, he, he says Roche is one of them in episode nine. He's like, get, make sure you get the brakeman, take him up train. He's one of us now. All these things where Leighton is very much trying to make sure everybody is unified to where he's like, we're all one train. Now. Yes. There isn't this class system. There, there's no classification. There's no people of higher power. You're, you're going to be assigned something. Yes. But yeah, yeah there's yeah. no... You know, you get better perks than somebody else because you're of this status. Yeah. So I had a few notes here. I'll just go through them uh, really quickly. I thought it was interesting that the announcement that Chicago was mile zero yeah. on their trip. And, you know, I think at one point I had calculated that one revolution was about six months. But then I'm still not sure about it because there's a shot. And I took a screenshot of it and I emailed it to the Panels to Pixels account. I don't know if you can put it in the show notes yeah, or not. It. Yeah, I saw it. Yeah. There's a scene where Melanie has a map behind her. And there's red lines on this map that look like it's over the whole world. Huh. And it, But there's but there's parts of the – there's parts of that – line that have turns that are way too sharp for the train to make. So I'm not, I'm still not sure what that map is. So, because I, I, I zoomed in on it earlier today and there's a couple of really like sharp, almost 90 degree turns on those red lines that I'm thinking there's no way that could be the train track that could be outlined in the train track. So I don't or know. Maybe a crossing track. Who knows? <sighs> maybe a crossing. I, it, but it, it definitely looked like, it was not over oceans. It was definitely using land to circumnavigate the entire globe. So I thought that was interesting. I love that we, you know, we suspected all along that Jinju knew the truth about Mr. Wilford, or at least knew what Melanie had told them yeah. about Mr. Wilford. We get that confirmed in her conversation with Till. I love that moment. I laughed every time between LJ and Osweiler, where she pulls out the the hard boiled egg that she stole <laughs> from the dining car and he pulls out the salt and she says, but how do we peel it? And she's like, she doesn't even know. She's so sheltered and been so yeah. the rich, the rich kid that she doesn't even know how to peel an egg, a hard boiled egg, <laughs> a hard boiled egg. Yeah. She doesn't even know how to, how to do it. I was just like, that's just crazy. And again, I already talked a little bit about the, the reveal of Alexandra that I knew as soon as I saw that it was a girl. Girl, I knew that it had to be Jennifer Connelly's daughter. She even kind of looked like Jennifer Connelly a little bit with this super short hair. But then when I looked it up on IMDb, I realized that the actress playing her is Rowan Blanchard, who she played the, the daughter, the lead role in Girl Meets World, which was Disney's sequel to Boy Meets World, if anybody was a fan of the Boy Meets World huh. franchise. So the girl playing Alexandra is the girl who played in Girl Meets World. So I thought that was, that was kind of a cool connection there. Yeah, definitely. So overall about the, the, these two episodes, you know, it's like, I'm, I'm curious as to where this train is going within itself. <laughs> yeah. There's so much social structure that is being changed within the next season at this point, because now you're incorporating new people and the, the quick glimpse of what they showed us at the very end. I'm curious, like, like you Steve, you know, yeah. as to what Wilford will bring to that change. Yeah. There's a lot of things, a lot, a lot of things set up in this episode 10 for season two, for sure, that uh, we just, we just don't know. They're just, it's up in the air. And I don't, I don't want to say what I saw in the preview that is the biggest spoiler that I don't, that I don't want to give away uh, <laughs> that I saw before my DVR cut off the, uh, the, end. I watched it live. Did so, you? Well, I watched. I mean, it was live. I didn't watch it live, so I so all I got was what the DVR cut off at the yeah. end of the the preview. We so, we we were doing a uh, live watch with a watch thread on the panels to pixels Facebook page. So it was Daphne, Cat, Alex, and myself. Oh, very nice. That were doing very similar to what Walking Dead cast does with its Patreon, where you know. I just create the thread based on the two episodes. Mm -hmm. We could throw in our ideas and thoughts as we're watching. A lot of people like doing that during commercial breaks. So, and it was a good time. So if you listeners are interested, go to the Facebook page. So when we do a live watch thread, it'll be posted. I posted it that morning, I believe. So that way, anybody who's going to watch live, do it live. We could all interact that way. And it's all through comments, so, but it was fun to do that, and I, we all saw that very end, and I'm not going to give anything away. Yeah. But it, it was pretty much like, oh, 
<laughs> you know, you can't yeah. wait for the next season to happen, you know? Exactly, exactly. Kind of like the boys. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> so what have you got for a comic talk? You got some things here? Yeah, I got a few things. The first one would be Keanu Reeves is apparently writing a comic book called Berserker for Boom Studios. That's coming out this fall. And it's a story about, this is the official description from Boom Studios. Quote, unquote, uh, the man known only as Berserker is half mortal and half god, cursed and compelled to violence, even at the sacrifice of his sanity. But after wandering the world for centuries, Berserker may f have finally found a refuge, working for the U.S. government to fight battles too violent and too dangerous for anyone else. In exchange, Berserker will be granted the one thing he desires the truth about his endless blood-soaked existence and how to end it. Hmm. So this is pretty cool coming from an actor who at one point, you know, loved all the cyberpunk stuff that was out there. Obviously, we've seen him in The Matrix and there was another movie, uh, oh, Johnny Mnemonic. Mm -hmm. And he got into the whole cyberpunk era. And obviously, we know him as Bill and... Uh, what is it? Bill? Yeah, from Bill and Ted. And... Mm -hmm. He's done action movies like Speed, like we kind of referenced Actually, that. I think he was Ted. I think he was Ted. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Ted Theodore Ted Logan. Ted Theodore Logan. Yeah, I get yeah. them mixed up. I don't know why. And Bill S. Preston Esquire. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, the fact that he's jumping into these things, and obviously he's a comic book fan. So I, I think it's pretty cool that he is involved in the writing of that. So uh, look out for that when it comes out this fall and go to your comic shops. Put it on your pool list if you're interested. But he's going to be one of the writers on that particular comic. Hmm. Second one would be Disney Plus has made an announcement that Falcon and the Winter Soldier is going to be delayed till later on this year. It was supposed to be out at the end of August, but it got delayed again. So uh, we're not going to get too much Marvel content from that coming anytime soon. Yeah. But the the best thing that we have is if you guys did not subscribe to the DC app, but now that... It seems with the DC apps content seems to be moving to HBO Max mm -hmm. and possibly Netflix or, or other streaming services. Swamp Thing Season 1 is going to be on the CW now mm -hmm. for the September release. So the show was originally in the DC app, and I watched the whole season. I loved it. It was a good take on the Swamp Thing series. It was very different from the comic in some respects, but... Derek Mears was great as the Swamp Thing, and the cast themselves are really good. Hmm. And you see uh, Ian Zierling in it, too. Huh. So, And I know I just saw a, a quick article before we started recording. I think it was from comicbook.com that Disney Plus is also, or Marvel has, has uh, said that uh, WandaVision is going to be delayed yes. as well. Uh, yeah, later. because they coincide. And that's working within Doctor Strange and the Multiverse, the multiverse yeah. of Madness. Yeah. I'm still trying to get caught up on podcasts, so I don't really have uh, anything to recommend <laughs> at this point. I did send in a voicemail for the TV podcast industry season finale uh, or season finale wrap up of Penny Dreadful City of Angels. So you should hear me on that. I sent in a voicemail to, to House Podcastica for the Cobra Kai. And also, if you are a fan of Walking Deadcast, Walking Deadcast has... Was record or they last night or tonight actually I think are uh, recording their ten year anniversary. So the Walking Dead cast podcast has been around for ten years. Oh yeah, and that's the I caught them in the third year. Yeah. I don't remember <laughs> it was it was uh, I know it was second season of the show was when I started listening I think. But yeah. uh, you know so so many of us have made connections now through the Zed Heads Patreon group. And through and mm -hmm. owe so much to Walking Deadcast, the Walking Deadcast podcast on Podcastica Network, that it, I feel compelled to mention that here. So check out the Walking yeah. Deadcast on Podcastica Network. Yeah, that would be a big thank you to Jason and Karen, what they started 10 years ago with the Walking mm -hmm. Deadcast, and then creating the Patreon for that particular podcast, because that's how Steve, Kat, Daphne, Alex, myself have all. And you've all heard us in various guises on this particular podcast. So as you all know, you know, I, I love to have my friends on to a company on these podcasts. And, and it's great because we all have a uh, mutual love for all these shows and everything. And we 
during these times of this whole pandemic, we've been coming together, doing things, having fun, chatting online. We get Zoom calls together, play games. So it's good to have friends who are all over and <laughs> we could have fun with, you know? Absolutely. So uh, I only have two recommendations. That one would be House Podcast with their review of Cobra Kai seasons one and two. And that would be with Rima, Jason, and Richard. And they are doing a great job. I can literally hear the smiles on their faces as I listen to them talk about the show because that's how much Jason has a love for it. And you can tell they're having fun with it. And yeah. that's the whole point of podcasting is really having a good time talking to friends and bringing up cool things and just having a whole discussion about it. Next up would be the Celebrity Spotlight with Ben Beck on our own network, the Next Level Podcast Radio Network. He just did an interview with Kevin Bigley from the show Upload, and you can find that on Amazon Prime. And he did a world premiere of the live video broadcast of that on Facebook. So my recommendation to Ben was to, to do that often, and I think he's going to continue doing that often with celebrities. So I think that's pretty cool. So you could actually see the interview live as they're doing it. And then eventually you could hear it on the podcast itself. And I'm thinking that he's going to start to do more video as well, which I highly recommend because that's where everything is going nowadays. <laughs> mm. I have uh, a couple of YouTube recommendations, the daily woo with Adam, the woo, and he's been covering the Disney world openings or reopenings now with everything that's going on and reviewing how they're doing things within Disney world and giving a lot of advice at what to bring, what, where to go, as well as Tim Tracker on his YouTube, which they're very similar. Tim does it with his wife, and uh, Tim doesn't bring his wife too much because they just have they have a newborn baby. So, but I recommend both their channels. That would be Adam the Woo and Tim Tracker. And lastly, would be the Grim Life Collective with Michael and Jessica as they continue to do their up all night with the Grims. They started this at the very beginning of the pandemic, and I have a lot of fun doing that with them because basically you just watch the movie that they set up through YouTube on a device. You could watch it on your TV through Apple TV, and then you just put on your computer or put on your iPad their direct link on YouTube as they are you know, talking about it and they have a whole chat thread you could do live and they'll interact with you live too as you comment and talk. And it's nice to have that like connection where you can talk to people as well. Absolutely. So uh, we can be heard on Spotify, Google Play, Apple Podcasts, or whatever podcast player of choice you choose. If there's a ability to do a review on there, please give us a five-star review, subscribe, follow us, all those kind of things. We are out there. We are on social <laughs> media. Um, the best way, are, we do have a website. It is panels to pixels podcast dot com. You can also submit your theories and feedback through our Facebook group, which is facebook.com slash panels to pixels. You can email us at panels to pixels one at gmail.com. That's panels to pixels one, the T O spelled out right there in the middle and the number one at gmail.com. You can call us at 845-350-2095. That's 845-350-2095. You can also catch us on YouTube. And in fact, if you go to YouTube this week, you will be able to see our 100th episode, which was a uh, video interview with Mike and Ming from the Comic Book Men on their Shared Universe podcast. But it is, is up on our face, our YouTube page, which is Panels to Pixels podcast. Give us a thumbs up there. Subscribe to us. And I think uh, Mark's going to have some even more content coming out to that YouTube channel next week as well. I would definitely check it out. We'll have – we did the your whole interview, and it's edited and up, so you can see that. That's the, the whole interview itself on YouTube. And then this week, like Steve was saying, I'll have outtakes. <laughs> Pretty much the first 20 minutes before I actually got into the interview where we were just talking casually, which is fun. So it was pretty cool. And Mike and Ming are very laid back. They're really nice guys. I met them so many times. They know my face. They know who I am. But it, to me, it was just like talking to a couple of friends I know. And uh, I look forward to going down to a shared universe's offices at the end of August. Very cool. So check that out when you can. And where else can listeners hear us, Steve? 
Okay, I'm can be heard right here, of course. Uh, really, this is the best way to hear my voice. I am, as I said before, getting caught up on podcasts that I missed while I was on vacation. So you can you'll hear my uh, my voice on various podcasts, voicemails, and and things as I send those out and get those uh, to people. But what's going on new with you, Mark? Well, as you all know, I had left Talk Through Media, but there's a new thing that's in the works right now, and part of that comes with. And you'll listeners all heard Daphne on her podcast previously. She's creating her own podcast. I will probably make a cameo on that. Expect to hear that podcast towards the end of August when once a network is launched. I'm not going to give the name just yet. I want everything to be 100%, but I will be on Run For Your Lives with Daphne at some point. So you could hear me there at that time. Right now, currently, you hear me here, or if not, some of my feedback, just like Steve on other people's podcasts. <laughs> so that's our show for this evening. Thanks, everybody, for listening. I'm Mark. And I'm Steve. And this was Panels to Pixels. And we'll see you all on the next panel. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.